it is my honor to welcome you to the second session of the World Summit on Combating and Preventing Forced Organ Harvesting from living people, particularly prisoners of conscience in China. I would like to welcome our distinguished speakers who are here with us backstage. Welcome to our registered audience who will be participating in a live Q&A session in a little while. And finally, I would also like to welcome those watching our live stream broadcast. Compliments to Epoch Times TV and NTD TV. Thank you all for joining us today. I have been advised that yesterday over 50,000 people joined the first session from across multiple platforms. We look forward to welcoming even more people today. Yesterday we heard from some of the most accomplished experts in the medical profession. Today we will have the privilege to hear from distinguished legal experts. They will present on the theme of pursuing accountability for forced organ harvesting crimes through the lens of a legal profession. The World Summit comes as a result of extraordinary coordination across five continents between dozens of experts spanning a broad range of fields and across 19 different time zones. We will witness truly historical series of events addressing what some have dubbed as the worst crime against humanity in modern history. Transplantation of organs pivots on one key element, voluntary donation with consent by the donor. In the West, stringent laws are in place to ensure that no violations are possible and there is strictly no commercialization of the process. That is why it takes years for an organ to be available. In China, it takes about two weeks or even only days as the so-called donor is most likely a prisoner of conscience who can be killed on demand. In the West, the recipient is matched to the donor. In China, the donor is matched to the recipient. In 2019, an extensive review of previously conducted investigations took place, headed by Sir Geoffrey Neese, QC, lead prosecutor during the Slobodan Milosevic trials at The Hague. Sir Neese headed this China tribunal and concluded that forced organ harvesting is undeniable and occurs on a large scale beyond any reasonable doubt. The primary victims are Falun Gong practitioners, but also Uyghurs and other political prisoners. Sir Geoffrey Neese's groundbreaking year-long investigation concluded almost two years ago, yet we are still missing the action and legal measures that one would expect after such a unanimous judgment. Is this a violation of legal international guidelines? Is this process in violation of China's own constitution and regulations? What role does the legal profession play in combating and preventing the crimes of forced organ harvesting? These are just some of the questions we will explore today as we hear from one, some of the world's leading human rights lawyers and legal experts. Without further delay, I will introduce our first speaker. We are honored to have Dr. David Matus from Canada. Dr. Matus graduated from Oxford University, England and is a legal expert specializing in refugee immigration and human rights law. In 2006, Dr. Matus was one of the first investigators to report on mass force organ harvesting from Falun Gong practitioners in China. He examined multiple phone interviews with doctors in Chinese hospitals and confirmed that organs were specifically harvested from living Falun Gong practitioners. 
Dr. Matus is a co-author of multiple reports and investigations, making him perhaps one of the most informed experts on this topic in the world. Today, we will hear him thoroughly analyze the legal elements in China, the role of the judiciary, and how the system has allowed for these crimes to go unabated for over two decades. Let's hear from Dr. Matus. Evidence of the mass killing of prisoners of conscience in China for their organs has been available since 2006. One reason, though far from the only, for the conclusion that these killings were occurring was that there were no laws in place, either in China or outside China, to prohibit or punish the acts. In the intervening 15 years, there's been a number of changes in the legal landscape. In this presentation, I want to give an overview of this landscape, both in China and outside of China, both internationally and nationally. In China, after the evidence was published in 2006, that China was killing prisoners of conscience, primarily practitioners of Falun Gong for their organs, the state enacted a new law directed to organ transplant abuse, without repealing the old laws, which specifically allowed that abuse. The State Council enacted a resolution on organ transplantation in March 2007. It became effective in May 2007. That law prohibits the live har harvesting of organs without consent. It also prohibits the sourcing of organs from deceased who expressed when alive a wish not to donate their organs after death. As for sourcing of organs of deceased who said nothing before death, either for or against donation, the law authorized the spouse, adult, children or parents to consent. But what about sourcing of organs from deceased whose bodies were unclaimed or about whom the near relatives were silent? On these matters, the 2000 law said nothing. There are too much older laws which address those questions. The 1979 rules of the Ministry of Health provide that dissection carried out by educational and research institutions, including medical schools, when conducting teaching or research can be conducted on corpses which no one claims. There's no requirement of consent from anyone. A regulation of 1984 adopted by a wide range of Chinese government entities on the use of dead bodies or organs from condemned criminals has a similar provision. It enacts that uncollected dead bodies, or the ones that the family members refuse to collect of condemned criminals, can be made use of. The 2007 law did not amend or repeal the 1979 or 1984 laws. But the legal problems in this area of China are not just a gap in the law or a failure to repeal older laws. The Chinese reality is that its Communist Party controls the legal system. The party does not use the law to prosecute itself or impede or hinder its behavior in any way. In Communist China, the law is used only against those not on good terms with the party. The rule of law does not exist in China. Instead of the rule of law, there's the rule of the party. The mass killing of prisoners of conscience for their organs in China is state-run, institutionalized. It occurs through the operation of the prison system and government hospitals, including hospitals run by the military as profit-making businesses. Typically, family members do not claim bodies of arbitrarily detained prisoners of conscience, whether Falun Gong or any other such prisoner. Families may not know where the detained relative is. They may not even know the fact uh, of detention. Even if they know, families are often reluctant to have anything to do with the authorities for fear of being accused of not turning in the victim for having adopted a practice or behavior or belief that the Chinese Communist Party views as threatening to its supremacy. 
The mass killing of prisoners of conscience for their organs serves a dual purpose for the party. The killings eliminate what the party sees as its political enemies. The organ sourcing plays a large part in funding the health system. The selling of organs in China is a multi-billion dollar business. It helps to finance the health system as a whole, allowing medical institutions and hospitals to keep their doors open after the party shifted China from socialism to capitalism and withdrew significant amounts of state funding from the health sector. It is implausible to suggest that the party would have shut down or would shut down this organ trade, no matter what the law said. At the time uh, that David Kilgore and I did our initial report on the killing of Falun Gong for their organs, there was no international instrument prohibiting cross-border organ trafficking. The obvious candidate would have been the Protocol to Prevent, Suppress and Punish Trafficking in Persons of the United Nations Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime. That protocol prohibits trafficking in humans for the purpose of organ removal. China is a party to both the convention and the protocol. The United Nations Office in Drugs and Crime, the UN bureaucracy charged with the work of the convention and its protocols, has regrettably taken the position that however similar the terminology seems, trafficking in humans for the purpose of organ removal is different from organ trafficking, and that the convention and protocol do not cover organ trafficking. Into this breach came the Council of Europe, which negotiated and adopted in 2015 a convention against trafficking in human organs. The convention requires states' parties to enact legislation penalizing organ removal without consent or with financial incentives. The legislation must penalize this behavior wherever in the world it is committed by a citizen or permanent resident of a state party. There are currently 11 ratifying states and 15 states which have signed but not ratified the convention. The 11 ratifying states are Albania, Croatia, Czech Republic, Latvia, Malta, Montenegro, Norway, Portugal, Republic of Moldova, Spain, and Switzerland. These 11 states in principle should have the necessary legislation to put them in compliance with the convention. Joining the convention is not limited to member states of the Council of Europe, and indeed one non-member state, Costa Rica, has signed uh, the convention but not ratified it. Observer states can sign on their own initiative. Non-observer states require an invitation from the Committee of the Ministers of the Council. And that, of course, that permission can, of course, be requested. In addition to Costa Rica, Canada, the U.S., Mexico, and the Holy See are observer states. Above and beyond the 11 Council of Europe states, we can see a few other states which have passed the necessary legislation. Israel was first off the mark. Israel in 2008 enacted a law which prohibits receipt of a reward for organ removal from the body of any person. The law also prohibits organ brokerage. The prohibitions apply whether the organ removal or transplant takes place inside or outside Israel. The law further prohibits reimbursement through the health insurance system of transplantation abroad conducted in violation of the standards uh, of the legislation. That law was uh, effective in almost shutting off completely uh, transplant tourism from Israel to China. Taiwan in June 2015 enacted a law prohibiting the use of organs from executed prisoners, as well as the sale, purchase, and brokering of organs. The law specifically bans transplant tourism. Patient who, patients who get organ transplants overseas must provide legal proof of the source of the organs in order to be eligible for state-funded medical aftercare. 
An Italian law of December 2016 penalizes globally the trading, selling, and buying of organs. Belgium, in April 2019, enacted a law which made the existing prohibition against commercial transactions in organs extraterritorial so that the crime can be prosecuted when it takes place abroad. The law penalizes brokers and organ recipients. So let me say this by way of conclusion. Uh, a number of other national jurisdictions, uh, besides the ones I, I set out, have actively considered changes in the law. There have been bills before a Parliament, Congress, Legislature, National Assemblies, without so far enacting them. The United Nations has 193 member states. The number of states which have enacted the ne necessary legislation is pitifully small when compared to the size of the global community. Though there have been several changes overall since 2006, and the initial reports of the killing of Falun Gong in China for their organs, the problem remains. The changes have not been sufficient inside China to stop the mass killing of prisoners of conscience in China for their organs, and they've not been sufficient outside China to stop foreign complicity in those killings. A lot more needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Matas. Next, we are pleased to welcome Carlos Iglesias Jimenez from Spain. Mr. Jimenez is a longtime advocate for human rights. He is the only lawyer in the world who has successfully filed a lawsuit against China's former president, Jiang Zemin, for his crimes of genocide and mass torture of Falun Gong practitioners. Mr. Jimenez has a wealth of knowledge and expertise. Let's hear what he has to say today. Quiero agradecer especialmente mi invitación a esta cumbre para la prevención y castigo del crimen de sustracción forzada de órganos. No es fácil para mí resumir en pocos minutos las vivencias de 18 años la defensa de los derechos humanos en China. Pero aprendí en todos estos años a amar y a respetar no solo la cultura tradicional china de 5.000 años, sino al propio pueblo chino, sus valores, sus creencias, lo que hace de verdad fuerte a la nación y al pueblo chino. Pero desde hace décadas, China está sangrando en su corazón. Es muy triste vivir lo que está ocurriendo bajo la dictadura del Partido Comunista Chino y específicamente en este crimen de la sustracción forzada de órganos. Cuando hablamos de este crimen, realmente tenemos que ser conscientes que tiene individualidad propia, tiene caracteres propios. Esta atrocidad nunca antes la había conocido en la historia de la humanidad. Cuando estamos hablando del tráfico ilegal de órganos, no estamos alcanzando la perversidad que el crimen de sustracción forzada de órganos provoca. La dictadura del Partido Comunista Chino se ha caracterizado en estas décadas no solamente por restringir y eliminar las libertades individuales y colectivas del pueblo chino, sino que muy especialmente se ha focalizado en perseguir las creencias lo que la persona piensa, lo que la persona cree, lo que en definitiva es su valor más importante, intrínseco, 
lo que es ella misma, dentro de sí misma. Ese es el objetivo prioritario en la persecución del Partido Comunista Chino a las creencias espirituales. Este crimen de sustracción forzada de órganos tiene básicamente tres características que lo diferencia de cualquier otra actuación criminal que se haya podido cometer en materia de órganos. En primer lugar, lo que persigue el Partido Comunista Chino es erradicar, eliminar físicamente a las personas por sus creencias espirituales. Estos prisioneros de conciencia, como pueden ser cristianos, tibetanos, budistas, pero muy especialmente los millones de practicantes de Falun Gong, el objetivo prioritario es su eliminación, su erradicación. Y esto tiene connotaciones, lógicamente, para revestir las características de un delito de genocidio. Pero esta no es la única característica esencial que persigue el Partido Comunista Chino. La segunda característica de este crimen de sustracción forzada de órganos es la búsqueda del enriquecimiento corrupto del propio Partido Comunista Chino. El antiguo presidente Yang Zemin, cuando lanza la persecución en el año 1999 contra millones de practicantes de Falun Gong y otras también creencias espirituales en China, diseñó muy bien una estrategia desde arriba hacia abajo, involucrando a todos los estamentos de la propia estructura del Partido Comunista Chino. Y su objetivo básico era erradicar las creencias del pueblo chino, las firmes creencias del pueblo chino. La situación que se produjo claramente es la búsqueda también de lo que yo llamo la solución final. En la perversidad suprema que alcanzó el Partido Comunista Chino se ideó de una manera incluso diabólica no sólo cómo eliminar, asesinar a las personas sino cómo enriquecerse a través de esos asesinatos y surge el crimen de la sustracción forzada de órganos utilizar a las personas como banco de órganos vivos troceándolas vendiéndolas en sus órganos al mejor postor generando cantidades multimillonarias a la propia estructura del Partido Comunista Chino ideando para ello toda una estrategia de complicidad de los estamentos no solamente sanitarios militares, logísticos sino por supuesto propagandísticos y ahí enlazamos con la tercera característica de este crimen de sustracción forzada de órganos directamente intentar buscar lavar la imagen en el extranjero promoviendo de una manera propagandística que el sistema de trasplantes en China es eficaz está evolucionando, es exitoso engañando lógicamente a la comunidad internacional ocultando los crímenes e intentando además promover que esa industria de las donaciones de trasplantes inexistente en China completamente inexistente están teniendo un gran éxito por lo tanto nos encontramos ante un crimen que nunca antes había tenido este diseño auténticamente atroz buscando asesinar a las personas buscando generar un negocio multimillonario y buscando lavar su imagen en un sistema de trasplantes cuyas donaciones son absolutamente inexistentes este crimen tal y como lo acabo de escribir no tiene ningún amparo no tiene digamos una descripción legal en los países porque nunca la mente humana había podido diseñar había podido concebir una aberración 
tan grande como la de poner a una persona en la mesa de operaciones habiendo sido catalogada previamente por sus órganos abrir su abdomen estirpar su hígado, su riñón, su corazón asesinándola en el proceso de la estirpación e implantando estos órganos en el receptor que ha acudido a China previo pago de cientos de miles de dólares por esos órganos de la persona asesinada estas atrocidades no pueden ser consentidas no pueden ser ignoradas no pueden bajo ningún concepto quedar impunes y por lo tanto lo que procede es hacer un llamamiento a la sociedad civil a las personas a los corazones de las personas personas físicas individuales más allá de las organizaciones internacionales o de los propios gobiernos occidentales que lamentablemente a día de hoy no han dado cobertura a estos crímenes no han sido lo suficientemente rectos y no han sido lo suficientemente contundentes para condenar estos hechos y para enfrentarse a la dictadura del Partido Comunista Chino tenemos muchos ejemplos de ello el Partido Comunista Chino se ha infiltrado a través de muchísimas organizaciones internacionales Consejo de Derechos Humanos de Naciones Unidas Organización Mundial de la Salud las propias Naciones Unidas consiguiendo que todo pase desapercibido que todo sea silenciado que estos hechos nunca puedan ser de general y público conocimiento de la sociedad y de todo el mundo y lo están consiguiendo con el silencio cómplice de los gobiernos occidentales y de las instituciones internacionales y organizaciones internacionales. La resolución del Parlamento Europeo del 12 de diciembre del 2013 o la decisión de julio del 2016, 48-2016, del propio Parlamento Europeo instando a los países miembros a denunciar estos hechos de los crímenes de extirpación forzada de órganos y que los propios países tomaran acción para advertir a sus ciudadanos, no ha tenido ningún resultado. En España, en mi país, habiendo ejercido el liderazgo en el tema de la donación de órganos, siendo líder mundial, incluso siendo pionero en la modificación de código penal para prevenir y sancionar el delito de tráfico ilegal de órganos, sin embargo, no ha tomado ninguna acción tampoco para denunciar estos hechos. En España se han presentado 251.000 firmas al Congreso de los Diputados. Firmas de ciudadanos españoles que no han tenido ningún resultado en acción por parte de los políticos en España. Por lo tanto, es momento a través de esta cumbre de animar a la sociedad civil a las personas individuales a los corazones de cada persona para que tomen conciencia de que los que nos diferencian a la vez nos une como ser humano es tener la propia unión en unos valores respeto a la vida respeto a las creencias respeto a la libertad no se puede consentir estos crímenes terribles y se hace un llamamiento a las personas para pedir que acabe esto basta ya con el crimen de sustracción forzada de órganos hay que hacer justicia con las víctimas y tiene que ser la sociedad civil la que les impulsa tiene que ser cada persona tiene que ser cada voz la que se alce para pedir a su vez a sus gobiernos, a sus dirigentes políticos, que no permitan por más tiempo que continúen estos crímenes terribles que nunca antes habían sido conocidos en la historia de la humanidad. La dictadura del Partido Comunista Chino se mueve muy bien, o bien comprando voluntades, o bien sobornando voluntades, o bien amenazando voluntades. 
Y eso lo puedo hacer con un grupo pequeño, pero no lo puedo hacer con millones de personas. Personas valientes que tienen que alzar la voz. Por eso esta cumbre es tan importante. Esta cumbre puede ser el detonante verdadero para que la gente tome conciencia de lo que significan las atrocidades del crimen de sustracción forzada de órganos. ¿Cuántos miles y miles y miles de personas han sido asesinadas, troceadas, vendidas sus órganos? ¿Cuántos? Pero lo que es peor aún, ¿cuántas personas alrededor del mundo saben de esto? ¿Podemos quedar callados? ¿Pueden quedar estos crímenes impunes? La justicia no solamente juzgará en el futuro a aquellos que son culpables de estos delitos, sino también la justicia tendrá que responder a aquellas personas cuyo silencio cómplice han facilitado, han posibilitado que todas estas atrocidades se lleven a cabo. Por lo tanto, como abogado, defensor de los derechos humanos en China y en el mundo en general, el mundo tiene que despertar. No puede ser que después de tantos años continúe impune estos crímenes. La sociedad civil es la que tiene que dar el impulso ante el silencio cómplice de las instituciones y organizaciones internacionales, ante el silencio cómplice de los gobiernos occidentales, las personas de buen corazón, las personas compasivas, las personas que saben reconocer los valores que nos definen como seres humanos, son las que tienen que dar ese paso adelante. Nunca antes la humanidad había enfrentado una atrocidad de estas características. El reto es gigantesco para despertar a la gente de su ignorancia, del desconocimiento de esto. Y esa es nuestra gran oportunidad con esta cumbre. Y yo les animo a todos, desde sus eh, posibilidades, que tomen acción, por favor. Que den un paso adelante, que ayuden a poner fin a esta tragedia y que de una vez por todas el corazón de China deje de sangrar y que el noble pueblo chino pueda recuperar los valores que definieron su verdadera esencia. Quiero agradecer de todo corazón de nuevo el haber podido participar en esta cumbre y estaré encantado de poder atender cualquier duda que se pueda generar y responder a la misma. Muchísimas gracias de todo corazón, mucho ánimo y ojalá que no solamente acabe esta situación terrible de la sustracción forzada de órganos, sino que sea justicia de verdad para con todas las víctimas. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Mr. Jimenez, for such powerful words and urging for international action. Which brings us to our next speaker. We're delighted to now welcome Teresa Chu from Taiwan. Teresa Chu is a renowned international human rights lawyer and a legal consultant of Doctors Against Forced Organ Harvesting, one of the co-hosting organizations of this summit. An influential leader Attorney Chu supported changes to human rights laws in Taiwan as advisor to the Taiwanese government. She is an expert lecturer speaking before international government officials, human rights organizations and members of parliament. The previous speakers highlighted that the forced organ harvesting atrocity is a diabolical international crime. Mrs Chu will now elaborate more about a new universal declaration that the organizers of this World Summit have prepared 
and which will be publicly introduced at the end of this World Summit next week. The Declaration will become perhaps one of the most important documents urging for national and international legislative change to prevent forced organ harvesting.打击及防治活摘器官的世界宣言 都不可以侵夺的人类尊严、人权、自由的基本保护上 在国际人权领域，于是，产生了很多国际规范，来惩治、来制裁惨无人道的人权暴行。然而，这些被国际公刑事法公认为最严重的罪行，在独裁政权政治力以及经济力的影响之下，被隐瞒着、被忽略者。因此加害的情况仍旧持续被害人的人数还在增加而中共活摘器官就是最严重的暴行之一在美国华府揭露了这个暴行的经过所主导所发起的联合国前酷刑专门委员 Manfred Novak 曾经向中共政府提出要求中共回应活摘器官的指控但中共却置之不理从请愿要求调查中共活摘器官的暴行活摘器官暴行以及捍卫思想自由和信仰自由的非政府组织
。在二次大战后的七十年间，许多国际人权公约陆续问世。对于人权、自由、正义，饱受战争摧残的二十世纪来说，人类决定以宣言以及国际公约的方式，再次来巩固人类赖以生存的普世价值的这个共识。而反活摘的世界宣言，就是以这些最重要的国际人权公约的核心原则，作为制止和打击活摘器官暴行的最高指导原则。这些人国际人权公约，包括《世界人权宣言》《公民权利及政治权利国际公约》《反酷刑公约》。以及生物医学的人权保护公约和欧洲理事会反对贩运器官的公约，我们必须提出来的是，活摘器官其实是一个结合性的重大犯罪的犯罪体系，它涉及的范围包括有器官买卖、器官贩运、器官的移植旅游。为了摘取器官而做的人口贩运。此外，它所涉及的罪责，最起码包括伤害罪、杀人罪、酷刑罪、反人类罪、群体灭绝罪。严格的来说，中共活摘器官的暴行，是一个体系复杂、环环相扣的。一个犯罪体系，而它的层面从独裁政权到民间，从海内到海外，涉及的范围甚广。活摘器官的暴行，除了作为清洗和灭绝法轮功团体及少数族裔的手段之外，更用于器官移植，带来了庞大的一个经济利益，包括。在器官买卖、器官中介、器官贩运当中所产生的这些利益，并且跨国跨境，因此我们谈打击及防治中共活摘器官的暴行的同时，必须要从国际层面以及国家层面共同入手。在国家的层级上面，我们呼吁。各国政府立刻制定反活摘的刑事立法，来严惩活摘器官暴行的加害者。在司法方面，应该进行积极的调查、起诉；在行政方面，不允许参与活摘器官的人入境。对于中国的医护人员，不予以。培训，不发表跟中国移植产业相关的学术文章，而且在第二点国际的层面上面，我们要不断的促进国际合作的交流。对于器官来源，尤其是非法器官来源的资料的整理、搜集、分析、调查。应该进行紧密的合作，在打击以及防治活摘器官暴行上面，从纵的面来讲的话，从国际到国内；从横面来讲的话，包括立法、司法、行政都必须调动起来，共同来做好打击跟防治活摘器官暴行的这项工作。谈到活摘器官最大的受害群体，这十五年来，经过人权团体、调查组织、各国政府的调查报告，已经确认了，中国的法轮功学员是活摘器官下最大的受害者，是中共镇压政策下最大的活体器官供应库。这在2019年，在伦敦成立的
独立的中国法庭也得出相同的结论，大致有以下几点：第一，就为了器官移植而杀害被囚禁者的行为继续存在；第二个，主要的受害者是法轮功团体；第三，对法轮功团体以及为主犯下的。是反人类的罪行，所以我们必须要说，要打击跟防治活摘器官的暴行，要制止中共大面积的活摘人体器官的这个恶行，就必须诚实的面对最大的受害团体继续成为器官供应库的事实。因此。我们在《世界宣言》的第八条的规定当中提到，所有政府应促使中共停止对法轮功学员和任何其他良心犯进行镇压、监禁和虐待，并停止活摘囚犯的器官，并促使中共开放拘留所及集中营。以便对于活摘器官的罪行进行自主独立的国际调查。我们必须沉痛地说，发生在二十一世纪大规模的针对一般平民进行强摘活体器官的暴行，竟然是由一个独裁政权——中共政府所发起、所指导的。而且历经了数十年而不止，实在是骇人听闻。反活摘的世界宣言，不仅是在巩固人类赖以生存的普世价值，包括了人类的自由、尊严、基本人权等等，同时呢，也在团结国际社会各界的力量，来打击这样子严重侵犯人类生存价值。和尊严的活摘器官的暴行，我们在此呼吁各国政府必须重视、正视、迅速的针对活摘器官做反活摘器官的立法。我们想提醒的是，活摘器官不仅是用于清洗和灭绝法轮功团体以及少数族裔之用。他们甚至把活摘来的器官做人体实验、做标本之用。犯罪的意图以及手法多样，是个严重的结构性的犯罪体系。但是到目前为止，却没有完整的一个国际公约，或者是一条法律的规定，来制裁这样子的暴行。因此。我们呼吁各国赶紧制定更为完备、更为详尽、更为严肃、严重的这个反活摘器官法。21世纪的人类必须针对这21世纪前所未有、史无前例的人权暴行，做一个全面的清除和惩治，为人权。和正义，写下历史上应有的一页。谢谢。And thank you, Attorney Chu, for such a resolute call to action and urging. An introduction of a new universal declaration about which we will no doubt learn more at the last session of this World Summit next week. Our final speaker for today's session is Kim Song from South Korea. Kim Song is a judge of Seoul Administrative Court. She is a member of the International Human Rights Law Community of Korean Judges. Her latest research particularly focused on the Korean involvement in forced organ harvesting in China. Transplant tourism presents many challenges on both national and international levels. 
the act of traveling overseas to receive an organ must first and foremost rely on absolute transparency of the donation system. Otherwise, the recipient may become an accomplice to a crime committed in the name of saving his or her life. Thank you for having me at this Meaningful World Summit. In this session, I'd like to suggest the global magnetic sanction, let's say GMS, as measures to combat and prevent forced organ harvesting in China. Today, we have to face the fact that People's Republic of China and Chinese Communist Party have been forcibly harvesting organs from their innocent citizens for over 20 years. No one will deny that it is crime against humanity. It took a long time for us to face the fact as it is. As a jurist, I think the China Tribunal put an end to the dispute on whether it really happens. Now we really need to put together our knowledge to end up this tragedy. Then how? It's not a crime committed by some individuals, but a systematic massacre by one sovereign state. Moreover, this state is a member of the UN Security Council as well as Human Rights Council. It might take another 20 years for UN to take effective actions against the crime. It's not really easy to make a concerted decision among 193 member states who have all different interests and pr principles under today's international politics. In this situation, autonomous sanctions by individual countries could be one option. And I think the global magnetic sanctions which US, Canada, EU, UK adopted in recent years are good examples. In US, the Global Magnetic Human Rights Accountability Act was enacted in 2016. It applies globally, authorizes the US government to sanction foreign persons implicated in human rights abuses anywhere in the world, freezing any US assets they hold and banning them from entry into the United States. It's encouraging that on July 2020, the U.S. government sanctioned Chinese government entities in Xinjiang and government officials for human rights abuses against Uyghurs. It opened up the possibilities of similar sanctions targeting Chinese government entities and officials. Furthermore, a very noteworthy phenomenon is that these countries are forming magnetic alliance. On March of this year, the United States, the European Union, Canada and United Kingdom all together launched coordinated sanctions against officials in China over human rights abuses in the Xinjiang region. This kind of cooperation creates a synergy effect. U.S. Department of State made a statement that they will continue to stand with their allies around the world in calling for an immediate end to the Chinese crimes and for justice for, the, for many victims. And finally, U.S. Congress is in progress to impose GMS on those involved in forced organ harvesting. Back in 2016, the U.S. House of Representatives unanimously passed Resolution 343 to call on China to end the crime. And on March this year, five Congress members introduced a bipartisan bill Stop Forced Organ Harvesting Act of 2021 which includes the asset freeze and entry ban sanctions. Then, what are the advantages of GMS in legal aspects compared with other sanctions? First, advantage of the GMS is that it is enacted and implemented only if its sovereign country makes the decision at domestic level, thus making it possible to impose sanctions on the foreign criminals promptly and timely. Second, since it does not directly target the criminal state itself, but only the criminal persons, it is relatively free from the infringement of sovereignty. When the West countries raise human rights issues in China and Hong Kong, China always hits back at the criticism arguing that the interference in its domestic affairs. But sanctions on individuals avoid this kind of CCP's nonsense. Third, entry ban and asset freeze can be justified by less strict proof 
than the sentence of guilt by the criminal court, since the former is lighter than the latter. Moreover, each nation has a wide discretionary power in the immigration control. Finally, it is a form of smart sanctions which can avoid an intended adverse impact on the vulnerable populations who are not involved in the crime. To summary, global magnetic sanctions are available and convenient measures at present against China's forced organ harvesting. Then, can such sanctions discourage malign actors and promote accountability for human rights abuse? In my opinion, yes. First, the original Russia-focused Magnitsky Act of the U.S. seemed to be quite a threat to Kremlin, because it is known that many Russian officials transfer their fortunes to the West. It's the same for China. Moreover, the fierce power struggle in China strongly drive the Chinese officials to prepare for the escape from mainland China. In 2017, media reported that 85% of high-ranked officials in China are preparing for the overseas escape. Between 1995 and 2008, more than 18,000 officials fled the country, smuggling out assets totaling $145 billion. In 2014, an estimated 1.2 million Chinese officials had immediate family abroad. Thus freezing their overseas assets and banning them from entry into overseas countries can be a significant threat to them. It means involvement in the human rights abuse like forced organ harvesting could be a big risk for their future. So the GMS have an effect of letting them think twice before being involved in the crime. When people outside let them awake and alert, there is a good possibility for them to change their minds. Then. Do we have obligation to take actions? In my opinion, yes. First of all, the obligation is derived from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But that's not all. We also have a duty to rectify our faults because people outside China have been directly or indirectly involved in the forced organ harvesting industry for several years. For more than decades, the main consumers of the or organs from China were foreigners. Early in 2000, Korean patients began to rush toward China for the organs, becoming VIPs of the horse organ harvesting industry. Even after the shocking and credible report, Bloody Harvest was published in 2006, and Israel took an immediate action to stop their citizens flying to China for their organs, many countries neglected the illegal transplant tourism. As the China Tribunal pointed out appropriately, those who interact in any substantial way with China is interacting with a criminal state. However, few had courage to face the truth. If most of the doctors in transplant society except a few stood on the side of China without raising any doubt on the source of the pouring organs from the China. More fundamentally, rest of the world are responsible for negligence in CCP's gross violation of human rights. We witnessed the Tiananmen massacre in 1989, then the brutal persecution of Falun Gong practitioners since 1999, and its ruthless repression of ethnic minorities such as Uyghurs and Tibetans. However, we accepted the totalitarian state with open arms and trusted the regime to be a good partner in the international society. Meanwhile, CCP never stopped its reckless human rights abuse expanding the scope to Hong Kong and a tribute to the astronomical capital inflow from the West. It has grown up to a mighty monster seeking hegemony of the world through its One Belt, One Road project. What is even worse is that we intentionally or unintendedly spread the CCP's propaganda demonizing the victims. For example, in Korea, there is an organization which aims to slander Falun Gong and other religious minority groups in China and to refuse the religious refugees from China in the name of Christianity. The little organization is famous for a close relationship with Chinese Communist Party. Thus, I reached a conclusion that actions against China's forced organ harvesting is not a charitable activity, which is optional, but a must activity to fulfill our obligations. Global magnetic sanctions can be good first step. We already have detailed profiles of Chinese high-ranked officials who are in charge of 
first organ harvesting. And then, the expansion of the magnetic alliance will make the forward efforts more effective and powerful. And it's important to secure the effectiveness and credibility of the GMS. The credibility of such sanctions depends crucially on our willingness to apply them without fear or favor, whenever and wherever gross abuses of state power occur. We should also keep in mind that the GMS is not an alternative to coordinate international criminal justice. Global magnetic sanctions are the minimum available measures we can take now, and we have a long way to go beyond it. Nonetheless, starting with the GMS, we can have a chance to correct our direction toward human dignity. We are living in 2021 with one of the cruelest criminal state in human history, I must say. And we are deeply involved with the criminal state in various ways. If we ignore or do not make sincere efforts to deter the crime, blinded by profits and interest, that would be shame on the humankind of our time. Our next generations will remember us ridiculous, ignorant, greedy, coward and cold-hearted ancestors, even worse than those who ignored Nazi's holocaust against Jews. But the people are awakening over Hong Kong incident and the catastrophic pandemic. I hope the Universal Declaration on Combating and Preventing Forced Organ Harvesting being the center, people around the world stand up and call for their governments to take actions to stop this atrocity. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Judge Song, for such an articulate presentation. And in fact, in 2018, we were reminded of the grim reality of forced organ harvesting in China, thanks to an undercover investigation carried out by a Korean TV network. The world was truly shocked to see footage from a camera, uh, under undercover camera in a major Chinese hospital that were boasting transplants for Korean patients. In fact, even the quicker transplants in a matter of weeks for an extra $15,000. As we have heard today from our speakers, such crimes have continued unabated for two decades. And this brings us to the end of the formal presentations for today's session of our World Summit. Thank you very much to all our distinguished speakers what an incredible array of perspectives that we heard today, and no doubt we will have a very engaging Q&A session. In the moment, we will be transitioning to our private Q&A session where our registered attendees will be able to post questions. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the five NGOs who have created this World Summit. CAP, Freedom of Conscience, Doctors Against Forced Organ Harvesting, Korea Association for Ethical Organ Transplants, Taiwan Association for International Care of Organ Transplants, and the Transplant Tourism Research Association. These five organizations are united by, the, by their wish to end the crime of forced organ harvesting from living people. Now it is time to say farewell and thank you to our live stream audience. To participate in the Q&A at any of the sessions of this summit, you may register on our website. Please don't forget there are four more sessions coming up with many more experts sharing their insights with us.